Good morning and welcome to the monthly webinar that we do just to educate and just for the fun of it. This is from Warner Orthopedics and Wellness and I'm Dr. Warner, orthopedic surgeon in Baton Rouge. Today we're going to talk about inflammation again. I think probably we should revisit this at least once a year because this is one of the core fundamental reasons that most people feel bad in any way, shape or form, but in, it's particular with musculoskeletal conditions. It's something that the orthopedic and musculoskeletal industry, if you will, has sort of been ignoring for a very, very long time, uh, how lifestyle and diet and things like that might actually make people feel bad, and that maybe surgery is not the answer for every single thing in the world. So we are going to talk about inflammation and the basics, and then I've kind of changed the talk up a bit uh, with some updated information about how inflammation directly plays into orthopedic and connective tissue conditions. That's me. I already said I'm Dr. Warner, orthopedic surgeon from Baton Rouge again. That is my clinic, uh, the physical therapy part of my clinic. The offices are on either side of that. Uh, as you could see, we work very closely with our physical therapists because I think, um, you know, getting proper strength and flexibility is integral to how you feel and are very simple, low cost ways that you can help manage yourself. All right, inflammation, one of my favorite topics. So what is it is what we're going to talk about and why should you care? Uh, how does inflammation happen? There's acute and there's chronic. What does that mean? If the camera's shaking, it's a technical issue happening here. It's not an earthquake. Uh, what makes inflammation become chronic? And then how does diet participate in inflammation? So this is a key factor that I think we've missed um, all along in medicine and especially in the surgical subspecialties, okay? So when I was in medical school, only 13% of medical schools taught anything about nutrition. And if they did, it was for about a month and it was just on macronutrients. Uh, so I think more medical schools are considering teaching nutrition now, but really food is medicine and medicine should be food. Um, so diet plays a huge role. And then how does chronic inflammation, that's crooked, how does chronic inflammation um, impact you and your connective tissues? And if you don't know what connective tissue is, it's exactly what it sounds like. It is what is connecting you to everything else. So think of yourself as sort of a suspension bridge. You're suspended with a skeleton, but you've got tensile lines of fascia connecting all the muscles and everything else. That's why we don't just fall over all the time. Um, so connective tissue includes everything from skin to muscle to bone to ligaments to tendons uh, to the lining of blood vessels, things like that, okay? Um, and then how can you make your connective tissue better and reduce your levels of inflammation? We're going to talk about all of that. So buckle up. Oh, yes. Feel free to ask questions, uh, but just know... If you're interested in how to incorporate supplements for these issues, I am going to get into that at the end in, in pretty decent detail. So maybe we could reserve those questions to the end. Go ahead and like and share. Okay, what is inflammation? So there are two essential types we think of in medicine. And of course, this is very simplified. There's acute and chronic. Acute means short-term, sudden. Chronic means long-term, usually low-grade, kind of simmering and just stays there. Acute inflammation is sort of what you're familiar with. It's one that you can feel and see, right? That's when you like get a paper cut, a bee sting, an ant bite, uh, you fall, you skin your uh, knee, whatever. You'll have redness, swelling, it gets warm and it starts to hurt. Uh, that is acute inflammation. That is a necessary and fundamental process of a defense system for us to exist in this world. So think of yourself as in a bath of viruses and bacteria all the time, allergens, pollutants, et cetera. And the only reason we're all still standing here and I'm talking to you is because of our immune system. So you have to have some inflammation. Some inflammation is not just good, but awesome. The problem is when it becomes chronic inflammation. So this, you don't know what's going on. You don't really feel it. Uh, there's no really good signs for you. There's, you know, we're just starting at biomarkers, uh, but we now know that this is a scourge. This is the fundamental problem in the modern world in terms of causing all of the chronic diseases from which you suffer. 
So science has proven that chronic low-grade inflammation can turn into a silent killer that contributes to cardiovascular disease, cancer, type 2 diabetes, and other conditions. And what we're going to focus on today is how it plays into arthritis and things like that. Okay, so the word comes from inflammare, a Latin word to set on fire. Uh, the four cardinal signs of inflammation, if you ask any doctor uh, what is inflammation, they're going to say a rubor, tumor, a color, a dolor, and all that means is red, pain, heat, and swelling, okay? The four cardinal signs of inflammation, which you're familiar with. You could have told me that yourself just based on your experiences with ankle sprains and things like that. Um, he also named a demon sepsis, Hippocrates did, and he described inflammation in the 5th century BC. Okay, think about that. 500 years BC, uh, he names it as a response to injury. And then Celsus, who's Roman, described the four cardinal signs, rubor, tumor, color, dolor. So rubor is red, tumor is swelling, color is heat, dolor is pain. Um, and then Galen, you've all heard of Galen, and he was the physician to Marcus Aurelius, okay, who was a Caesar, thought that inflammation is what allowed blood to escape the arteries. Remember, that was back in the day where they all thought all ills were due to bad humors, you know, like bloodletting and things like that were a good idea. Um, and all, this was really the prevailing thought until we develop instrumentation and technology that allowed us to delve deeper into the natural world. And then we started learning about what inflammation really is. Okay, so Ledbetter in 1989, okay, that's not that far ago, right? Like that's not that um, distant in the past. He described the classic injury response. Activation of platelets, which is a white blood cell fragment kind of a thing that carries all the growth factors and healing things, and endothelium. Recruitment and activation of leukocytes, that's your basic white blood cells, and I'm gonna give you a description of the important ones. Proliferation and repair by the endothelium and fibroblasts. Fibroblasts are cells that form fiber, which is the fundamental building block of connective tissue. And then remodeling happens eventually. So the, this is your injury response. So first you form a clot and stop the bleeding, stop the damage, right? Then you come in, clean things up. Then you bring in the helpful cells and then you begin to grow more cells and then you remodel and recreate the structure that was injured. That's how it's supposed to work. So it is vital for survival, as we described. These are little nice images of different types of white blood cells. The bottom right is a neutrophil. That is the most common one, usually, and the one that is most involved in um, your initial response to inflammation, pathogens, things like that. Then you've got the lymphocytes. Eosinophils are more involved with like allergies and things like that. Monocytes become other cells. And we're going to talk about the ones, some of the ones that are important here today. Um, but just know that there are multiple different types of white blood cells, and each of them has sort of a, a role to play in terms of the protection. So it's like they're like divisions of the military, and like eosinophils in charge of protecting the airways and the mucous membranes. Neutrophils are in charge of protecting the serum, et cetera, et cetera. So start thinking of it as that way. Everything is very organized, but there's a lot of communications, a lot of overlap, and a lot of redundancy and, and ability to make up for deficiencies. Okay, so when you have an injury, the neutrophils will enter, protect you from the bad guys, the pathogens like the virus and bacteria, because they will actually engulf the bacteria and then spit out these things called lysosomes, which are filled with literally acid, and they destroy the pathogens. So that's their role. And then they begin to do debris cleanup. So they, they like clear the field to make the runway. Think of it that way. And then they start sending out signals. And then they bring in the other white cells, which then start to begin the remodeling and the proliferation and the actual healing phase. Problem is when these comms get messed up and then you stay in this acute injury kind of destroy, destroy, clean up, clean up, destroy, destroy, clean up, clean up, but nothing ever gets rebuilt. That's what chronic low-grade inflammation is. So normal skin is on the left, and then skin adjacent to a wound is on the right. You see how it gets thickened? There's a lot of extra cells that come in, namely the white blood cells. There's a lot of swelling and just a lot going on in this acute phase of inflammation, mostly neutrophils and macrophages, and we're going to talk about macrophages a lot. Um, the neutrophils will come in and promote angiogenesis or the formation of new blood cells, which obviously nothing heals without oxygen, so you got to get the blood in there. And then turns on and off genes inside the nucleus of cells like the fibroblasts 
or cells that form muscles or cells that form bone, they will actually turn, send signals, cytokines, which are little protein signals, they either turn on or off genes that are responsible for healing and repair or more destruction and cleanup. And so that's your activated innate immune system. Innate meaning it's inside of you and it's always on the ready. So this picture is great, I love it, because it shows you that sort of phagocytosis, which is Latin just for chewing up. So the white cell will sense this bad cell and it does it in a very elegant way. So all of the white cells have receptors, pattern recognition receptors that respond to molecules that they know are not human. So uh, viruses and bacteria will spit out different little signals that are known as non-self, like the body just is aware of this. And then it will sense it, it attaches the receptor, then the, back, the white blood cell knows to attack whatever just sent that molecule to it. Okay, and then it phagocytizes it, engulfs the bacteria, dumps a few acid buckets on it, kills the bacteria, breaks it all up, recycles, destroys it, and then spits it out. And in some way, shape, or form, you get rid of it eventually through your system through the various ways that we evacuate products. Did I finish that slide? Yes, okay, thank you. All right, so without these pattern recognition receptors, and we'll talk about them a little bit, but they can, they can sense damaged human cells, they can sense viral cells, they can sense bacterial cells, and they can sense senescent or dead cells and different inflammasomes or cascades of proteins that indicate um, inflammation in certain regions. Without these pattern recognition receptors, it would be like playing a sport where everybody's in exactly the same uniform and looks exactly the same. Or a war like that, right? Where everybody's undercover. Now, how do you do that? How can you ever hope to make headway this way? So think of the molecular patterns as uniforms and the pattern recognition receptor is you see the uniform and you know, hey, that guy's on the other team, I'm gonna go steal the ball from him. Or hey, that guy's on my team, I'm gonna send him a signal, pass the ball to him and he's gonna go do something else with that. So chronic inflammation is like permanent friendly fire in some cases, meaning the system gets confused and the pattern recognition receptors start to recognize self or human antigens as non-self and attacking. And that's the fundamental problem with being autoimmune or having like rheumatoid or lupus or things like that where you self-attack. It's like permanent friendly fire. That's how I think about it. Okay, so summarize acute inflammation just so you remember through this talk. It is gonna be a response to some sort of bad stimulus, an injury, a pathogen, a disease, like a tumor or something. Remember, all of us have cancer in us at all times but usually it's just one to two cells. The immune system senses it comes right before it can go haywire, all right? Uh, so this is going on all the time in you, and you don't wanna shut this down completely. You need to have a solid immune system. But acute inflammation should happen, do its job, and everything should resolve, and it should not continue, right? Uh, it should just destroy the pathogen, get out of the way. The damaged tissue from an ankle sprain, a paper cut, whatever, should just be cleaned up, they should get out of the way. And this should only last days. The problem is when we have different stimuli that cause this chronic inflammatory process to happen that never ends. And then you have damage to your cells at a very uh, structural level, and we'll get into that. Okay, this kind of just shows you the phases of inflammation. It's very uh, regimented, and acute inflammation really should be quite short. Um, most tissue, and we'll have a slide that shows us later, we'll hit percent of its strength, somewhere around like six or seven. That's why a lot of times your follow-up six weeks or whatever, just to see if you've hit that 50% tissue strength um, parameter in terms of healing and remodeling. But remember, the neutrophil comes in first, attacks, and then starts the cleanup, and then the neutrophil is supposed to die, and then the macrophages are supposed to come in and clean up the neutrophils. So the neutrophils are like the first phase of, of the battle. They go in, those soldiers get knocked down, then the macrophages come in, pick up those guys, and then continue the process. There's two types of macrophages. One would be signaled by the neutrophils to become an M1, which is very highly uh, inflammatory, and will go in and still continue the attack and destroy mode of being. The other one, the M2 macrophage, is going to promote tissue healing, the cell proliferation, the resolution of the inflammation. So one of the fundamental problems with chronic low-grade infection, uh, chronic low-grade inflammation, things like diabetic wounds and things like that, is that you have this 
all ratio. We have too many M1s and not enough M2s. So this kind of shows you the phase of healing, okay? So that's when those platelets are activated. You clot, you stop, you stop the bleeding, literally. So you stop that initial damage. Within hours, you've got all the neutrophils coming in, doing their thing. And then within days, the neutrophils should be done. The macrophages should be coming in. And then just a few days after that, the macrophages should be mostly M2 and starting to fix things up, okay? Sadly, most of us in a modern society are in this kind of nowhere land where you're kind of got a lot of M1 macrophages, a lot of neutrophils, and a lot of inflammation going on, and just these persistent damage molecular patterns that continue to trigger those pattern recognition receptors. And this is just ongoing. And, and then self cells get attacked, or human cells, or cell membranes, things like that. So just remember, this should all be very short-lived, uh, and the healing process is what should take time. But in America and in the modern world, most of us are in this low-grade chronic inflammatory state, which is just not good for cellular health. So again, within hours of injury, so this is an ankle sprain, you can see the swelling around the ankle, a little bit of bruising starting. Within hours of injury, these macrophages, which is the gray picture, should be coming in and starting to clean up the neutrophils that are probably already there. Because remember, the platelets come in within minutes. You sprain the ankle, you're, you know, something's bleeding. Your body's going to stop that bleeding right away. The swelling, you most notice happens around day two or three, right? Most swelling is around day three after surgery or injury. Uh, so you can kind of just expect that, but it starts right away. Um, and then you know now that the macrophages are coming in to do their job somewhere within that first day, really within hours. And then this is a little bit later in the ankle sprain evolution. Now we have less swelling. All the bruising has kind of happened where the bleeding just kind of settles and that's visible in the tissue. But you still have pain, you're still weak, and the tissue is certainly not healed at this point. But your M1, remember your pro-inflammatory, your, your attack and kill macrophages are coming in by two days, 48 hours to come in and clean up the neutrophils, clean up the stuff the neutrophils started to clear out. And then to get rid of those neutrophils and start to send out the cytokines or signals that will turn on the M2s and then also bring in the healing, the anti-inflammatory proteins, the anti-inflammatory gene signals. They're going to promote the blood. Or the, or the formation of blood vessels, I should say, they're going to start the protein synthesis for the extracellular matrix and also for collagen bundles and start to just rebuild the tendons and ligaments. And then they're also going to activate the stem cells in the region. So if it's in cartilage, it's going to activate the stem cells that are going to form cartilage cells. If it's in bone, it's going to activate stem cells to form bone cells. If it's in muscle, so on and so forth. Okay. So the issues are hugely important and you need to have the right ratio. Okay, so again, activation of the innate, it's inside of you, it's always on the ready, it's present, it's just hanging out. Macrophages are just hanging out in your connective tissue at all times, waiting to be turned on or off. Okay, in fact, most autoimmune diseases affect connective tissues because most white blood cells and immune system, that's where they kind of hang out throughout the day, waiting to be utilized to your benefit. So the cytokines, the little proteins these things spit out, the white blood cells, are either going to turn on inflammation or turn off inflammation, depending on the signal and the signal that made that signal. So remember, I told you communication is hugely important in this. It, this is what I'm talking about. And then when you have certain cytokines coming from either the M1 or the M2, the cascade down and enter the nucleus, so this is showing you hitting a receptor on the cell membrane, that's that purple stuff, then the the receptor is triggered and it uh, starts a protein cascade inside the cell, goes, goes actually to the genes, to the DNA, and will turn on or off certain genes. So these signaling pathways that are upregulated with chronic liver inflammation and acute inflammation is the nuclear factor kappa beta system. And a lot of the natural supplements turn this down, okay? The JNK system, which is very important autoimmune disorders. Again, natural medicines come down. And then NLP through inflammasome. And inflammasome means a group of proteins that are highly inflammatory. So all of these genes are turned on to make inflammatory proteins from the signals from the M1 macrophage and the neutrophils. So what you want is you've got to start getting the signals from the M2 macrophage to get out of this cycle. 
So macrophages are very, very important. And just all you got to remember is M1 should be the first thing, classic inflammation, just come in, get out within hours. And then you should be M2, which is healing, resolving, rebuilding, remodeling. Okay. And then um, these are all going to respond to the signals. So the pathogens evoke a pathogen associated molecular pattern. And then damaged tissue evokes damage associated molecular pattern. Those molecular patterns are sensed by the pattern recognition receptor, and then certain genes are turned on or off. So it's very, very elegant, but it's all dependent upon um, signals and communication. All right, so again, the macrophages are just sitting there. They're hanging out because they're there for a reason, for general tissue maintenance. All day, every day, we have micro tear, micro damage, this and that happens. But the human body is so amazing, as is most uh, it, of nature in that it's got the ability to self-repair all day long, every day. You give it the right micronutrients, you give it the right vitamins, the right environment, and you're whatever happens, you're gonna be able to repair it. Why? Because we've got macrophages just waiting to do that. They're just, it's like uh, having a maintenance team outside of your house at all times. Anytime something happens, you just say, hey, come in, uh, unplug my toilet. Oh, hey, my garbage disposal got clogged with a quarter that somebody threw down it. They're just there ready, waiting for general tissue maintenance. Um, they are alternatively activated into M2 or resolving and healing by certain proteins. So TNF beta, IL4, which is interleukin 4, IL13. So certain proteins make it the macrophage is more like they're rebuilding or whatever and fixing things. Other signals, which is like the da damage associated molecular pattern, IL6, TNF alpha, advanced glycation end products, lipopolysaccharide toxins, okay, from leaky gut pathogen associated molecular patterns, that's going to make your macrophages M1. And that's when your maintenance team's just going to come in here with some sledgehammers and start breaking off drywall. You don't really want that in most cases. You really just want the guys to come in and fix things, right? Um, that's the problem with chronic inflammation is you're always destroying, damaging, cleaning up, and there's never any sort of repair. And that's what we're trying to get you out of. So you want a good balance of M1 and M2, and you want it balanced appropriately at the right time. Right after you sprain an ankle, you want heavy on the M1, but very shortly thereafter, you need heavy on the M2. Problem is our systems are all stuck because of all of the bad signals we're getting from diet, poor sleep, and stress, things like that. And then you have less tissue repair, less healing. So chronic inflammation is essentially useless. Uh, not vital for anything. It lasts from months to a lifetime for people. It is terrible for your system. Uh, but sadly, even though it's so horrible and it's been here all along, we've only realized it in medicine within the past 20, 30 years, right? And in orthopedics, or less than that. Most non-communicable diseases like cancer, Alzheimer, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, uh, peripheral arterial disease, atherosclerosis, all of these things are, we think now, mostly due to chronic low-grade inflammation, and then it's cohort oxidative stress. So there's no good reason to maintain chronic inflammation, okay? We just need to get it gone, and then everybody would feel and act and function and perform a lot better. We have a question. Can they digest it? Okay. Somebody has a question. If they have autoimmune, can they digest supplements? And are they useful? If we're getting the question right. Uh, yeah, there's actually a very large body of literature that shows that supplements are helpful in autoimmune disorders, usually as an adjunct to whatever medicine you're on. Uh, but for instance, uh, omega-3 fatty acids have been studied extensively in conditions like rheumatoid arthritis and are very helpful. Um, and help make whatever given medicine you're on, or if you're not on any medicine, um, your outcomes are better. So yes, they are very useful because remember, supplements are exactly what they sound like. They're supplementing what should be inside of you anyway. So usually there's a deficiency or not an optimal level. So you're just getting up to the optimal human level of all of these things. So most times supplements are very effective and very safe. So what are the causes of chronic low-grade inflammation? And you probably already know this uh, innately, but let's just run through it. Failure to actually eliminate a pathogen. So some um, bugs are very long-lived in your body. Think of the herpes virus. Most people harbor that, and then it'll come out late in life as shingles. Tuberculosis is a lingering, stays in you forever disease. 
Uh, certain fungi, think of all the toenail fungus out there, okay, that is a very chronic, low-level pathogen that goes nowhere. Certain parasites, certain viruses, okay? Exposure to ongoing, exposure to ongoing irritant. So I am in Louisiana, surrounded by chemical plants. So I know that the air is not the greatest, the water quality is not the greatest, the soil quality is not the greatest. Um, so chronic exposure to pollution can do this to you, to radiation, it can do it to you. Uh, poor diet, obviously, we're going to talk about that extensively. Autoimmune, which I think you've already picked up on. And then just recurrent acute inflammatory stressors. So let's say you just keep catching COVID or you can just keep catching the flu. Um, then you're always in this cycle of acute inflammation that's just never going away. And then mitochondrial failure. Now, remember from my previous talks, the mitochondria is a little organelle a tiny little organ inside of a cell, this is where your fuel is con converted to use usable fuel by your cells. The mitochondria is the engine of the cell, and it's also heavily involved in protein synthesis and things like that. When your mitochondria fails, whatever cell type it is failing in, that's when we fail. So mitochondria failure is a primary source of free radicals, reactive oxygen species, and induction of inflammation by sending out damage associated molecular patterns, things like that. So when you have failed mitochondria and exposure to all of these ongoing signals, you're gonna have more reactive oxygen species, more advanced glycation end products, higher levels of uric acid, higher levels of oxidized LDL, more things like homocysteine, all of which is pro-inflammatory. Okay, so does lifestyle really matter? Yes, it does. Uh, in fact, I love this study because these are two twins. They're both astronauts. One went up into space for a very long time. One did not. And they studied over time. And in fact, um, lifestyle, you know, your exposure to certain types of foods, obesity, gravity, or levels of oxygen, all really matters. And non-heritable, meaning not directly linked to a specific allele on your genetic sequence, Non-hereditable -hered factors are the largest contributors to systemic chronic inflammation. That means it's stuff that's in your control. You don't have to say, oh, I was born this way. That is almost never true in this case, okay? So physical, chemical, biological elements of exposure, and this starts while you're in the womb, prenatal. So you can have genes turned on and on based on what your mom is eating and what her mom ate. And I know that sounds crazy, but it's called epigenetics. This is a real thing. DNA will be methylated or unmethylated, turned on or off based on diet and exposure to things, even while you're prenatal. So yes, lifestyle is hugely important, but I'm gonna give you some simple things you can do starting even today uh, to help fight this scourge of inflammation. So diet-induced obesity is a number one problem in this country and probably what we really need to focus on and get rid of. Um, in diet-induced obesity, you do have, by definition, more M1 macrophages floating around in your connective tissue than M2. So when you have obesity, which is, and I'm going to tell you how this all works in a few slides. Anyway, the fat cells actually send cytokines or protein signals and are always making the macrophages, the neutrophils in that active, upregulated, acute inflammatory position, the M1 role or M1 phenotype. It's constantly attacking tissues and damaging things and making reactive oxygen species. So this is what we want to pull out of. Oh, someone said thank you for talking on inflammation. You are welcome. Missy? Missy, you're welcome. All right, chronic activated inflammation and arthritis. Remember I said we were going to focus on that? So in the bone, when you have chronic, upregulated, active arth um, inflammatory condition, you're going to have more M1s in your bone. In the bone, the M1 macrophage is also known as the osteoclast. And this is the bone cell that destroys bone. And problems with osteopenia and osteoporosis, weak bone, is an imbalance of the osteoclast and the osteoblast, the bone killing and the bone forming cells. So with chronic low-grade inflammation, you're always going to have an imbalance of the class and the blast. You're always going to be making your bone weaker and weaker and weaker. Um, and then more pro-inflammatory cytokines or proteins come in and make the animal macrophages even more active. Okay. And in osteoarthritis, it's been found that in the synovial lining, which is like 
every joint has kind of a water balloon around it holding the synovial fluid, which is like the lubricating fluid. Well, each of the water balloons, it's usually just a couple cells thick, but it's constantly producing the fluid. Um, in arthritic people, the synovial lining is packed with more M1 than M2. So the ratio is again, same thing in the cartilage, same thing in the bone right under the cartilage. So arthritis is a whole joint disease. We've talked about this before. It's not just wear and tear on the cartilage. It's the bone right under the cartilage. It's the ligaments and tendons around the joint. It's the joint capsule. It's the fat here and there, and then also the muscle attached to the joint. All of that gets this imbalance in the connective tissue of too many inflammatory white blood cells and not enough healing white blood cells. Um, and so we're now starting to realize more and more that osteoarthritis is not a wear and tear problem. It is a So how does fat, how does being obese do this to you? Well, we used to think of additives or is simply the storage, so excess nutrient processing, excess energy intake. We used to think it was harmless. It just sat there. Sure, it was heavy, but no big deal. Well, now we know it's hormonal, it's biologically active, and it's constantly 20 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Excess adipose tissue produces adipokines, which are highly inflammatory cytokines, and they're always keeping you inflamed. So that is one of the fundamental problems with obesity and why we need to treat it and why a lot of uh, pharmaceutical companies and industry is really spending a lot of time, effort, and research trying to combat this scourge. Okay, So the adipokines are cytokines produced by adipocytes, and they are pro-inflammatory, constantly produced, positive of chronic low-grade inflammation, and things like leptin, IL-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha, all those things are spat out in the inflammatory. And then that leads to problems with insulin receptor sensitivity, cardiovascular disease, arthritis, even rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis. And then, of course, if you have excess storage um, on your system, that's technically considered obesity. So your fat, adipose, is making this whole list here of proteins that are pro-inflammatory. So these are all in the circulation then, telling all of your cells, all your white blood cells, hey, we're in an inflamed state, we need to go attack and kill. We can't repair anything, we gotta just get the job done. So it's just a mess up in communications because the wrong signals are being sent out all the time. And then that is that is made when you have the correct balance of adipose tissue, and pronectin is reduced. So it's kind of just a balance, right? Osteoporosis is too many osteoclasts, not enough osteoblasts. Um, inflammation is too many M1s, not enough M2s. So we just gotta get the balance right. Low adiponectin has been correlated with high CRP. Probably everybody out there is now getting their CRP checked, which assesses Sorry, audio issues. Okay. Do I need to go back? Can you guys hear me now? We just switched the mic batteries. Okay. All right. So just real quickly, you probably can see this slide. What you need to understand is nobody cares about obesity just because of obesity. It's because of what obesity does to you. I know as an orthopedic surgeon, if I want somebody to get better and feel better and they are obese, until I get rid of that, or signals and they're not going to feel better. So that is why we are very pro uh, normal body weight in medicine. It has nothing to do with anything else except that we know that this is going on and it is attacking every single organism. It's so again, highly inflamed, metabolically dysfunctional and active adipose gets filled with 
macrophages itself. And then these little pockets in necrotic or dead adipose tissue would send out more damage associated molecular patterns. So the cascade gets continued and amplified. Um, and then these inflammatory factors get out into your bloodstream and everywhere. And remember, everywhere. So these signals get out and reduce inflammation in your knees, in your hands, in your spine, in your brain, in your heart, in your skin, you name it. And all of it is because of altered communications and unnecessary signaling to turn on the acute, innate, and adaptive immune systems um, with these pro-inflammatory cytokines. So at this point in medicine, we know that obesity is causally linked to chronic low-grade inflammation. It's no longer just a correlation. We are pretty sure it's causative. So just keep this in mind. I'm a big fan of history. And J.P. Morgagni, if I'm saying that correctly, 250 years ago said this, right? But of course, modern medicine can't listen to somebody what they said 250 years ago. But he described visceral adiposity, meaning fat packed around the organs, 250 years ago and said it was not good. However, in the medical industry, in the pharmaceutical industry, in the surgical industry, nobody really cared. They weren't concerned about it. And they kind of just blew it off and went with that whole biomedical paradigm where, you know, you look at an x-ray and say, oh, that's not right on the x-ray. Must fix it. You will feel better. Missing the whole point of this, right? So in general, people like me, who are a proponent of good lifestyles, of diet as medicine, of avoiding surgery, focusing on things like reducing your mental stress, getting a good sleep schedule, maintaining good social contacts, things like that, um, were vilified and kind of like made fun of by our peers because it seems sort of hoo-hoo and like touchy-feely. But turns out it is really the only way to make you feel better and the best way to make you feel better in almost every situation. To the whole health of the day, even bother the definition for metabolic syndrome. Think about that. This has been known for at least 250 years. The World Health Organization just decided in 98 to say that there was a metabolic syndrome. I mean, it's crazy how far we've had to come, full circle. So, this, I love this image. It's a cross section of the human body showing you sort of what we call a fat suit. So if you have a certain amount of adipose tissue around, that is what you're carrying around every day, all day. That is a lot of extra cytokines being produced, a lot of extra capillaries that have to be built. The heart has to pump blood to all of those areas all the time. You have to carry it around. Uh, but more importantly, it's chronically metabolically active in a very bad way. And Morgagni said, those who have dissected or inspected many bodies have at least learned to doubt while those who are ignorant of anatomy and do not take the trouble to attend to it are in no doubt at all. And this is a common psychological uh, condition. People that know very little about a subject are very confident in their opinions of that subject. And then the more you learn, the less confident you become in your opinion on that subject because you start to realize you don't know what you don't know, if that makes sense. So the more you learn, the more you realize there is to learn. This is true in medicine. So in other words, most doctors know nothing about nutrition, so they're very confident in their opinions about nutrition. But the more you learn about nutrition, the more you realize that your prior opinions were not really that right and that you better keep reading. So to summarize what you've learned so far, you learn that obesity is gonna to lead to more M1 macrophages which are highly pro-inflammatory and damaging. The adipokines will signal to the resident macrophages, so the white cells just hanging out on all your connective tissue, the maintenance team outside of the house, remember, you'll get the adipokine signal to them. They'll come in. They're going to convert to the M1 phenotype, and they're going to just start doing the joy, you know, raising the forest, plowing the field, whatever they got to do to clear out the area, but they're never going to fix anything. They're never going to work the trees. And then this metabolic dysfunction from the mitochondrial failure that ensues with this process is going to lead to sarcopenia, loss of muscle, tendinitis arthritis, osteoporosis, all of the common orthopedic conditions we think of. So the goal of being lean is not so much to be lean and like, you know, wear a certain size of pants. Rather, it is to become more anti-inflammatory in general, which will make you feel amazing. So if you can, hold on, I guess we're having more issues. Oh my goodness, I'm sorry, guys. 
How come we don't get this fixed? What am I doing? Oh, we're muted. Hold on. Now, can you hear me? Anyone? Anyone? Here? Have we fixed our sound problems? Anyone? No? Oh, this is great. Okay, so we can actually go on. I am so sorry, guys. Uh, we, we, uh, we're going to work on a production capacity. We're self-funded, okay? I don't, I don't do commercials because I find them annoying when I watch webinars or listen to podcasts. So I'm not doing that to you. All right. So again, obesity is going to lead to more of these M1 type macrophages because of the signals from the obesity itself that turns on the macrophages and white cells harboring in your tissue to, to pro-inflammatory. So it's this sort of skewed signal where you constantly think you're attacked and you're sending out your uh, special ops to go kill and destroy right? But nothing ever gets better. It's like this constant 20 year war. Okay. All right. And then back to the other principle, I think that we all need to remember. So there's chronic inflammation, oxidative stress, and then insulin resistance. Mitochondria failure is another one of the big problems with our current society and lifestyle. Okay. Mitochondrial failure definitely leads to all of these problems because if you have an inefficient engine or a broken engine, it's just going to spew out way more exhaust than it needs to for any given amount of energy production. And then that exhaust is going to damage everything around it. And that's what's going on with failing mitochondria or mitochondrial failure, okay? Produces too much ROS. ROS means reactive oxygen species. We talked about this in a previous talk, uh, either oxidative phosphorylation or inflammation talk. The reactive oxygen species are essentially molecules that have an unpaired electron, and nature does not like an unpaired electron, so a singlet electron is always going to seek a pair, and it's going to do it wherever and whenever it can. It doesn't care if it's DNA, protein, your cell membrane, your mitochondria. It's going to pull that electron where it can get it, and it does not care what it damages while it does it. This is why antioxidants are so important. So the reactive oxygen species will actually then activate inflammatory proteins, sometimes through the senescence signaling, sometimes through the inflammasome, sometimes through the damage associated molecular pattern from the damage caused by these free radicals. And the problem just becomes this toilet bowl cycle that just gets worse and worse and worse. So reactive oxygen species will damage your cell membranes, they'll damage your DNA, they'll damage your chromosomes and your RNA, they'll damage your proteins, and then they'll even damage the mitochondria itself. Then you get more and more these damage-associated molecular patterns, which attach to the pattern recognition receptors on the white blood cells, and the white blood cells get the wrong signal, and friendly fire happens. So hopefully that kind of like wraps it up in a nice bow, and now we can talk a little bit more about arthritis and things like that. Mitochondrial quality control is very, very important for you and for me. If you want to age gracefully and optimally, and just really enjoy your golden years, so to speak, you don't 
want to have damaged mitochondria because we don't want these damage associated molecular patterns. We don't want to activate signaling for inflammation. We don't want to turn on the NFP system, the nuclear factor kappa beta gene. We want that transcription signal going in and making your cells produce pro inflammatory proteins. So we need to control the reactive oxygen species, the damaged mitochondria, and then the inflammatory proteins, right? Those are the, the fundamental mechanistic cellular ways you're going to make things better. And then I'll tell you the ways that you and I can control. Okay. So again, excess nutrient processing. This is when you eat more than you need. So you're just shoving fuel into the factory, but the factory can't keep up. Things start breaking. There's never time to repair. And so Keep shoving the fuel, the factory, the broken factory now keeps trying to process it. More breaks, more exhaust, more failure, more pollution. Um, and this is the final problem. So, what's happening in our society is we keep shoving nutrition at these mitochondria that don't need it, don't want it. Okay, they want to rest at some time. Um, and then they start to spew out more inflammatory media, more reactive oxygen species, right? Which is the byproduct of oxidative phosphorylation in the electron transport chain. So you get all these extra electrons running around and wreaking havoc. And then on top of that, this energy has to go somewhere. So you get all this ectopic lipid formation, meaning fats are just produced and sent out everywhere and harbor anywhere. So they're gonna stick it to the liver, they're gonna stick it to the muscle, they're gonna go everywhere they can pack in and then around the organs. And when they start becoming intracellular in your organs, that is true failure, okay? And then of course you have an inadequate and incomplete healing response. Why? Because we can never convert to the M2s. We can never convert to the resolvents, the pro-healing protein. You're always stuck in this inflammatory cascade of activation, primarily from excess nutrients and then insulin resistance that happens because of that. So these are the hallmarks of musculoskeletal disease too. Whenever we see people with mitochondrial dysfunction, ectopic lipid or aberrant fat formation, an inadequate healing, an incomplete healing, that is, that's musculoskeletal disease, right? Like you can never recover from an injury. Your rotator cuff tear never heals. Your arthritis never gets better. You just keep getting stiffer and stiffer. Your tendons get thicker and thicker. That is the hallmark of our problems of what I treat on a daily basis. And this is all started by chronic inflammation, too many reactive oxygen species. So if you can stop that, most people get better without surgery. Okay, so you understand basic inflammation, the immune system, the macrophage is acute versus chronic, and you understand mitochondrial dysfunction, and then you understand the inflammatory effects of obesity. And then you also understand how chronic inflammation makes your body feel. This is when you get up and everything creaks, you can barely move, you're inflexible, you're weak, you notice you're losing muscle, um, not as fast when you walk, you can't get up out of a chair as easily, just things just start going downhill and things hurt. That's how this makes your body feel. I'm telling you that we can turn this around and make you feel better today. This isn't an esoteric thing. This isn't me saying, oh, if you do this, the packing in your artery will re reduce by 30% in 10 years. Well, what does that mean to anybody? Or, oh, if you do this, I'm going to add two years to your lifespan. Well, okay, but I'm 40 or whatever, so what does that mean? What I'm telling you is if you can get this chronic inflammation and oxidative stress under control now, you will feel better now. And you will be able to do more now. You'll be able to be more engaged with your friends and family at work. Okay, so this is a great article showing that there is a connection between inflammation, mitochondrial health, and non-communicable diseases. This is from The Lancet, which is a fairly well-respected journal out of Europe. They looked at about 120,000 people and found that mildly obese lost one in 10 disease-free years in their life. Okay. So that's a 10% loss of disease-free years. I mean, you may live as long, but it's not going to be great because you're going to have some kind of a disease. And then the severely obese lost one in four disease-free years. So fully a quarter of your potential great, long, optimal aging life, like a nice health span, a fourth is taken away just from severe obesity. The other problems, tobacco use, harmful alcohol use, and unhealthy diet and physical activity. All of this is fixable, um, and we're going to talk about it. I wrote a book called Bone on Bone that addresses all of these and gives you a simple sort of way to think about it, a simple protocol that you could follow to help yourself with this problem. But what we want is more disease for years, not fewer. 
And so we need to start thinking that way. And then when you do, all of your musculoskeletal problems are going to get better and you're going to feel better. So this is somebody getting a total knee replacement. This is sort of what happens. The knee is opened and you put the devices on and then you saw off the diseased cartilage and you put in a metal and plastic sandwich. Highly unnatural. It does get rid of the pain because you're basically removing all the subconscious nerve endings and whatnot. Um, but really, in an ideal world, we would avoid this surgery and sort of we would treat our arthritis without it, okay? When I was a resident, really, this is still going on today. Uh, we were taught and continue to be taught, are continually being taught, I guess that's the correct grammar, that osteoarthritis is degenerative, that it's a wear and tear, it's an injury problem, okay? But early observations were done with not the same level of technological ability that we have now. And they just noticed that there were less white blood cells in the synovial fluid with osteoarthritis than with people that had septic or infectious arthritis. Um, I'm sorry, less bl white blood cells in osteoarthritis than people with septic arthritis or rheumatoid arthritis. So because of that, we were told, oh, it's not inflammatory. It's, it's just wear and tear. But that was just a lack of understanding of chronic low-grade inflammation. So we were comparing people with bad knees to people with a raging pus pocket inside of their knee and a severe autoimmune disease. And because it didn't really match up to that, we were told, oh, it can't be inflammatory, it's wear and tear. We now know that's 100% incorrect. It is an innate immune activation, primarily sometimes caused by cartilage damage, like let's say you fracture through the joint. You're gonna have damage associated with molecular patterns, obviously. Um, but if you are in a chronic low-grade inflammatory state from poor diet, lack of activity, lack of sleep, stress, pollution, then you're never going to be able to convert the cells in your knee joint to become healing and responsive and able to calm things down and repair things. You're always going to be in that damaged state, as we've talked about. So osteoarthritis is very, very known now to be an inflammatory con condition. And in fact, you can follow the progress of people with knee arthritis by their CRP levels now. So people that maintain a persistently high C-reactive protein, which is one of the biomarkers we have for inflammation, they are more prone to end up needing a total knee than not. So we know it's linked to inflammation. So diet-induced obesity and musculoskeletal disease, MSK, they're all chronic inflammation. I made this image to sort of show you marbled steak around a spine. If you've got fat infiltrated into your spine, posture muscles, your core strength, if it's all marbled like this, then you have insulin resistance by definition in the muscle. And you've got sarcopenia and weakness. And all of the fascia that's separating all of that is filled with M1 activated macrophages and a culture. This is a cross section of an MRI showing you those paraspinal muscles next to the spinous process and the vertebral body, marbled, filled with fat. I see this all the time. People come into my clinic with chronic back pain, you know, whatever. I get an MRI and I'm like, oh, I can just see the fat in the muscle, which means I know they're insulin resistant, at least the muscular level. I know the tissue there is filled with inflammatory white blood cells. And I know they're sarcopenic. They lack enough muscle to have a good core, and there's going to be stiffness and advanced glycation end products, which are abnormal proteins that form in the connective tissue. And all of this leads to things like back pain, aching, creaking joints, osteoarthritis, tendonitis, weak bone, and what we call motion segment integrity loss. So, like the way your hip is supposed to function with your lumbar and your knee, that, that coordination goes away because the signals are messed up, the nerve cells are messed up, the muscles are messed up. And all of this just comes back to diet induced obesity inflammation and oxidative stress. Uh, somebody has a question. Yep. Angela has a question. Angela asks a question, is it possible to have all markers of inflammation, blood markers on have symptoms of chronic inflammation? The short answer is yes, because I don't think that we know all of the biomarkers yet. More and more are learned about all the time. Um, but even if it's known, most of them are research only and not covered by insurance. Uh, I've tried to order different tests in my medical community. And if they know what it is that I'm ordering, it's definitely not covered or there's no code that can be attached to that test to get it covered. 
So the basic biomarkers that we know to check, the SPED rate, the CRP, things like that, those can be normal, and you still have chronic low-grade inflammation because we're not checking the right things, I think. So yeah, we still have this problem. Okay, so again, chronic inflammation is going to impact your joints, it's going to impact your joint muscles, the ligaments, the tendons, the muscles, the subchondral bone, the bone itself, the cartilage, and the synovial fluid. All of this is impacted by chronic inflammation by oxidative stress. Then the synovial cells, because they have all this inflammation around them, start to release their own inflammatory cytokines as signals. And then you get these things called MMPs, metalloproteases. These are protease. Anytime you hear ACE in medicine, that means an enzyme. Okay. These are enzymes that go in and chew up protein and damage protein. And what is protein? Collagen is protein. Where is collagen? All connective tissue, including cartilage. So these MMPs come in and degrade, and they are activated based on these signals from these chronically inflamed people. So chronic low-grade inflammation is a key driver of arthritis and arthritic symptoms. And remember, again, it's a whole organ problem. So everything is kind of going awry at once. This slide I pulled from a paper sewn et al. 2012, and it shows the inflammatory markers in normal or what was considered normal in a particular patient population joints, going over to people with significant inflammatory arthritis. And then red is more inflammatory biomarkers, yellow is less, see so this progression. And because osteoarthritis just isn't as crazy red as rheumatoid arthritis, we would thought it's just wear and tear. But in fact, it's not normal. It's inflammatory. It's just a much slower burn of inflammation. It's chronic, it's low grade. And it, it's a real thing. And I want you guys to understand that. And be, I want to empower you to manage this level of inflammation so that you can have all of those things for years. Is my mic still working? You're looking at my mic funny. Maybe we're having a feedback problem. Is that better? Can you hear me? Okay. Found my jacket? Like here? Okay. All right, good. Okay, so the synovium, remember, that's the water balloon around your joint, and it's normally just two to three cells thick. It's kind of hard to imagine. Um, I don't even have a way to describe that or a metaphor. It's just really tiny. It's really thin normally. And usually there are no inflammatory cells chilling in that two to three cell layer thick capsule. It's just supposed to make them a joint lubricant. Okay. When it gets inflamed, when it starts to get the altered signals and it starts getting infiltrated by white blood cells because of inflammation, it's thickened. Then you start getting these M1 macrophages fill it natural killer cells, which are another sort of a neutrophil, one of the first cells that goes to the site of injury. And then the T, the B cells, which are part of your adaptive immune system, and then mast cells, which are involved in nerve pain and things like allergy and stuff. Fewer M2 macrophages. Having more M1 would be fine if you had enough M2 to make up for it and keep the balance. The problem is you start getting more macrophages turned into M1 and fewer turned into M2 because the signals are screwed up, because there's too many adipokines coming, too much signal from damaged mitochondria, et cetera, et cetera. And so effectively over time, you have more damage to your connective tissue and an inability to repair as that damage happens. And then obviously at the end of the day, you're gonna have and you're gonna have problems with the system. But this is not a mandatory condition of life. So senescent cells, you may have heard of this if you listen to any kind of wellness anti-aging things. So senescent is just, most cells have a certain finite number of light, like divisions they can do, and then they stop dividing. So they can either stop dividing and just be a biologically active, helpful little cell hanging out, but it's not really producing anything in terms of growth. Or they become what are called zombie cells. And it starts spitting out this SASP, which is a senescence-associated secretory phenotype. And that goes to the pattern recognition receptors on the white blood cells and it induces inflammation. So surgeons for years 
have known that there's these senescent cells in the cartilage because there have been these repositories where when people do the total knee and the picture of the surgery, and they reset off the damaged cartilage and it to these tissue banks and they just store it for future research. Um, they've known for years that there are these senescent cells in the cartilage from total knee arthroplasty patients, but then they knew that they were. And we just kind of like ignored them. It didn't make much of them. They continued to call it, call it wear and tear and things like that. Well, now we're starting to understand what senescent cells do, what zombie cells do, and what disinflammation do. So, you know, this talk today might change next year. The body of science is constantly moving, thank God. We're constantly learning. Um, but again, we should have known this 250 years ago, as I said. We just didn't have the tools to prove it. Now we're starting to the tools. So, inflammation, again, normal cell, divide, 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 divide. Eventually, it stops. Cell, and it's going to be a good guy or a bad guy. We want to always trigger it into the good guy. We've only really been knowing about this for two decades, and two decades is not a lot of time in the science world. Uh, I think it will be a lot of time soon, as now we have huge software tools and databases that let us learn things quicker. But chronic inflammation is the key to when you turn a cell to just a senescent cell to a zombie cell. So it's like I don't know if anybody saw that show, I can't remember if it was HBO, where the cordyceps invaded people and turned them into bad zombies. So chronic inflammation is that signal that makes it a zombie cell. Another reason we want to avoid chronic inflammation and all of those signals. We want our cells that have stopped dividing to just be biologically active, but in a good way, not a bad way. So just to review, you've got your PAMPs, DAMPs, and SAS. Pathogen associated molecular pattern, that's what your virus, your bacteria, your amoebas, your worms, what they're spitting off. Your damage associated molecular patterns, that's what injury, um, micro tears, a little muscle overuse, stuff like that, that's what that's going to spit off. And then your senescent associated secretory pattern from your zombie cells. All of these are going to go to your PRR, your um, pattern recognition receptor, and either tell the white cell to become inflammatory or anti inflammatory, depending. These are all going to be pro inflammatory. Okay, so just to sum it up, what we're trying to do is reduce the signaling to the receptors on your white blood cells, the pattern recognition receptors, toll like receptors, things like that. We want to reduce the pro inflammatory signaling because we don't want to upregulate the transcription factors proteins that go into the nucleus and tell what DNA to turn on and off. We don't want them to go make you more inflamed. And so we want to turn down the NFKB system. We want to turn down the MAP system. We want to turn down the IRS. All of these are transcription factors that tell the nucleus to make more inflammatory proteins and to continue this cascade. And so we need to stop the signaling to the pattern recognition receptors to stop the signaling to these guys or you got to find an alternative way to turn off these transcription factors and then make your cells stop producing more inflammatory proteins and make your nucleus start making healing proteins. And the same thing is going on in the tendons too. A lot of uh, articles in orthopedic literature don't talk about this at all. Um, I have to go into journals in the basic science world or like laboratory science to find this information because our uh, normal journals are just not doing this. Um, but the same mechanisms of inflammation that cause diabetes, Alzheimer's, cancer, and osteoarthritis, they're also attacking the tendons ligaments. This is why you get crazy, stiff, achy, and you can't like, um, your strength isn't as good because the translation of the muscle to the bone goes through tendon and ligament. And if that is uncoupled or not optimal, you're going to be weaker, stiffer. So all of this is going on in tendons too. In a Nature article, which is another great science journal, um, highly regarded, there's a recent review about tendonitis, and they mentioned treatments, and not once did they mention nutrition, stress reduction, sleep, Indian medicine, not that none of that was mentioned. All they talked about was drugs, inserts, steroid injections, and surgery, things like that. They did mention physical therapy, thank the Lord, in Japan physical therapy. Um, but that's because physical therapy does a lot of other things that turn the M2s up and the M1s down and make you anti-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. That's a whole nother talk. 
But I didn't want you to think this wasn't affecting your tendons too. Okay. Yeah, Angela, this, all of these talks are on replay. They're on the wellthory.com. They're on the Facebook page. And I think they're on wellthory.com. Oh, thank you, Pamela. Pamela said, thank you for the videos and that the products are fantastic. Thank you. We work really hard to get high quality products that will have meaningful impact. Okay, back to history. We missed the boat. We've been knowing this, but not knowing it, right? It's like what's old is new all the time. In 1881, Weissman said death takes place because a worn out tissue cannot forever renew itself. And because the capacity for increase by means of cell division is not everlasting, but finite. So we talked about that. That is called the Hayflick limit. That was described in 1961. The finite number of cell divisions that are able to happen by a single cell once you become an adult, there's only a certain number that can happen. That is the conflict limit. And then you don't want this non-dividing cell to become dangerous and zombie-like. You want it to just be there and be a little bit biologically active or go away and like be recycled in part. Um, no one considered what these guys were saying in 1881 valid for like 80 years. Okay. So again. People that are like outside of the mainstream and outside of the group think of the science industry, and I don't know what industry, probably speaking from your own line of work. If you're outside of the club, the group think club, you're considered crazy, and that can't possibly be true. And then everybody else gets scared to agree with you, and it just propagates, and nothing new is learned until somebody breaks through that group think um, barrier, that bias to um, not want to learn more. And I think this has happened in ortho and it's happened in musculoskeletal medicine, certainly happened in medicine for years. Only now are we realizing the importance of the stuff that your parents told you. It's all common sense. Eat your vegetables, calm down, you know, get some good friends. It's all very, very true. All right, my producer. Next slide. Okay. Some of you, I'm sure, are wondering, well, what about my gut? What about the biome? I know this is very trendy all over the place. I agree it's hugely important. That would be another talk in and of itself. I'm going to touch on it briefly in terms of musculoskeletal for you. Your nutrition generally decreases, meaning the quality of your nutrition as you age. I'm not sure why. I think because in modern society, particularly in this country, our elderly are not taken care of as well as they probably should be. And so a lot of them aren't getting the good home-cooked meals they should be getting. Um, and then you get decreased levels of immune-tolerant bacteria in your gut and increased levels of opportunistic bacteria or bad bacteria, okay? You're not feeding the gut. You're not giving it good fiber and good nutrition to make the gut biome where it should be and produce the proteins that are necessary for human life. Just remember this. We're not really humans carrying bacteria. It's more that we're bacteria carrying a human. So I think there's something like 37 billion cells in the human body. You have 100 trillion, maybe it's 37 trillion. You have a lot more bacteria hanging out in your gut. So there's more bacterial cells than human cells. And they're biologically active. And they need to be fed the right stuff, make the right proteins to help you out. Worse, if you get damaged uh, lining in your gut, which is connective tissues, there's these things with the cells called tight junctions. If the tight junctions in your gut lining split apart and get loose, you're going to let toxins and bacteria. That's the source gut you probably heard about from a bad gut biome. And this is when you get endotoxins like introduced, essentially poison introduced in your gut directly from the gut. And this in and of itself can cause arthritis and musculoskeletal problems. So manipulation of the gut biome is actually being looked at to treat chronic diseases, right? One of which is osteoarthritis. Okay, we got a question we have to answer. We're going to remind them we're going to get to the supplement questions. Again, okay. But we're going to... Okay. Karen, uh, your omega and tartary choice. He is not able to pinpoint it along with D3 and Z. That's good life. It's good. Okay, I got a loaded supplement question. And just remember, I'm going to talk about supplements as we get through 
part because uh, Karen is talking about her husband who's taking a lot of the supplements like omega-3, D3, zinc, uh, things like that, cherry extract. And he feels great, but he doesn't know, is it the supplements or is it his good lifestyle? Uh, I will tell you, it's probably both because supplements help, but without a good lifestyle, they're not as effective and vice versa. So I try to live as healthy of a lifestyle as I can, but honestly, who's got time for nine servings? vegetables every day. How do you make sure you're getting enough fiber? It's almost impossible when 80% of what's in the grocery store is ultra processed. So I supplement to fill gaps um, and to make up for what I'm not getting in my healthy lifestyle. I follow a very rigid circadian rhythm, I try to reduce my mental stress. I do all of that, but I still supplement uh, because I just I just want to feel great for as long as possible. So I don't know if you really want to test it, you got to do the scientific method and like eliminate one supplement for a while or eliminate one part of your healthy lifestyle for a while. But honestly, why would you want to do that to yourself? So I think it's probably both, but does it skew 70, 30, 80, 20, 60, 40? I don't know. I don't think anybody knows because those studies are impossible to do. We cannot do true lifestyle studies, right? The world is only accepting a placebo controlled randomized trials where you change a single variable. So people that are generally healthy, that's a lot of variables. We're never going to be able to study that. All we know is people that eat well and take supplements tend to feel better, look better, perform better, live longer, uh, and be cognitively intact for a longer time. So something about that combination is very helpful. Okay, so leaky gut, we just talked about it. Diet-induced obesity is known to alter gut biome to your detriment, so it makes it worse. It makes more bad bacteria propagate, and it's very pro-inflammatory. The tight junctions break, and then bacteria can leak into the body. This is implicated as causal, if not highly correlated, with rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, and other non-communicable diseases. I think there's even papers out there linking this to Alzheimer's. There's a very significant link between your bacteria gut, or the, the bacteria in the gut, good or bad, and then are they getting into your system in, an, in a way they shouldn't be getting into your system through a leaky gut. Okay, so LPS, you may have heard that term or seen it. That's lipopolysaccharides. These are the toxins or the poison produced by bacteria. That's how bacteria hurts you, right? So the toxins are able to infiltrate through a leaky gut through damaged tight junctions, which is caused by damaged connective tissue, chronic inflammation. And then these are PAMPs, pathogen-associated molecular signals, that trigger the pattern recognition receptors, the TLR4, that are sitting on the neutrophils. Remember I told you the neutrophils are part of the innate system that's always there, ready to go on, on the fly to attack, kill, destroy, and damage, but they don't really help with repair and remodeling. And then also you upregulate the osteoclast activity, which is again the M1 macrophage of the bone. And so you think now that the toxins from bacteria like coming through the leaky gut are a major additional cause of chronic low-grade inflammation. And believe it or not, some people are getting fecal transplants to treat this, to restore even the muscle integrity, so damaged, weak sarcopenic muscle due to inflammation, chronic inflammation. Some people have been getting fecal transplants the chronic inflammation goes away, the muscle comes back, and they start feeling better. The trick is that they don't tell you in these kind of studies and, and in studies of like probiotics and stuff, is if you don't keep feeding your gut healthy fiber and healthy food, it's just going to go right back where it was. So unless you follow up a fecal transplant with a healthy lifestyle and supplements, you're going to be right back where you were. Same thing with probiotics, I think. So why can't I just take pharmaceuticals to reduce inflammation? You're probably asking yourself, why can't I just pop ibuprofen all day? Well, the problem with the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, the synthetic anti-inflammatories, is they are now known to have very damaging cardiac side effects. So they are associated with heart attacks, things like that. Very damaging GI, gastrointestinal side effects, uh, everything from GERD and reflux to actual food and ulcers. And then worse, we know that they slow down bone and soft tissue healing. So they actually slow down the repair capacity of your connective tissue. So NSAIDs, for my patients, I try to keep them taking them if I can uh, by 
try to get them to take natural supplements and, and to incorporate lifestyle medicine into their lives. Uh, but sometimes you still do need to take them, like if you're having a particularly hard day or something happened and it really hurts, whatever. Uh, in those cases, ideally, you take it less frequently and at lower doses. So that's my goal for my patients, and hopefully you'll start to think that way too. I'm not saying you'll never take another synthetic drug again. Obviously, you will. The goal is to take fewer of them at lower doses. Steroids, generic, cheap, totally covered by insurance, right? And if you go into any orthopedic podiatrist, whatever office, and you're going to get offered a steroid injection, right? No questions asked. These, over time, downregulate your normal hormone production, like cortisol and whatnot, so they mess up what's called the hypothalamic pituitary axis. People on chronic steroids get osteoporotic, they lose muscle mass, they get sicker more often. It's an immune suppressor, right? That's how it works. So it actually shuts off an enzyme that starts the cascade to produce these cytokines, but it also makes it unable for you to fight off pathogens and bacteria if you use these long term. That increases your overall cortisol level. We know how damaging that is. And if your cortisol is increased all the time, then your melatonin is messed up, and then your sleep cycle is messed up. So steroids are not a great answer long term either. And then the NSAIDs I told you is an enzymatic reduction. So steroids turn off phospho lipase A2. NSAIDs turn off the COX, the cyclooxygenase protein or enzyme, COX1 and COX2 or both. Um, and it's a single molecule effect, so it turns on or off an enzyme immediately at a very high level. That's why you feel better right away as opposed to natural supplements, which take about 60 to 90 days to get incorporated into the system. So you have the single molecule intense mode of action with a rapid onset, but it's doing nothing to reduce those transcription factors I talked about, it's doing nothing to help your mitochondrial function and reduce reactive oxygen species. It's doing nothing to stop the M1 and M2 imbalance. It's really just turning down one set of prostaglandins to make you feel a little bit better right away. Meanwhile, you get the cardiac and the GI issues, and it's also slowing down tissue. So yes, you can take drugs to reduce inflammation, but I wouldn't recommend it as a lifetime plan. I think we have better ways. Natural products are a better way. All natural products are based off of stuff that's already in the food. That really works from fruits, vegetables, and other types of food, okay? They uh, change your overall levels of reactive oxygen species because a lot of these molecules are antioxidant. Vitamin C, vitamin E, things like that, alpha lipoic acid, all found in food products, right? When we take supplements, we're just getting more of them to fill deficiencies and optimize. They reduce the inflammatory signaling. Importantly, natural antioxidants and anti-inflammatories, things like tartary extract, the anchothiacins within the pigment varies, okay? actually downregulate the nuclear factor kappa beta transcription factor. They downregulate the JNK, which is implicated in things like rheumatoid arthritis. They downregulate the NLRP. So natural anti-inflammatories actually get to the fundamental source code, if you will, that is inducing all of these inflammatory proteins to keep getting produced over and over and over again, giving chronic inflammation. The synthetic drugs don't do the same thing. They're just shutting off one molecule at one time at a very high level. So you gotta start thinking of it as, uh, this is like when a military goes in to change the hearts and minds, and you go in and you start to build villages, you build schools, you improve healthcare in the region, et cetera, and you start to change the fundamental problems of the region rather than just fixing fires as they burn and just come in and dump a bunch of chemical fire putter outer and calling it a day and thinking you did a good job. That's why I love natural medicine and why I think you're probably watching this. The entourage effect of natural substances found in this food system today actually changes the fundamental problems at the cellular nuclear DNA code level to upregulate anti-inflammatory and healing factors and downregulate pro-inflammatory damaging factors. And to my knowledge, in all the literature I've, I've read, and I continue to read to make sure that we have the safest, best quality products that we can, uh, I can't find any cardiac, GI, or systemic adverse events with these molecules that are basically coming out of heart cherries, coming out of strawberries, things like that, found in your food supply, found in broccoli, found in meat products. Um, all of these are normal substances that the human body evolved with and help us work better and function better. So we recently got a comment from a doctor 
uh, on the Well Theory website. I wanted to read it to you because this is sort of probably what you face when you go talk to your doctors about stuff in terms of natural medicine. And I certainly get this from my peers. So don't, you're not alone. So quote, I don't understand why people think that natural chemicals are better for you than synthetic ones. Is there some unwritten rule that says that nature makes things better than man does? Synthetic anti-inflammatories are stronger and work better for people than turmeric. But if you have an obsession with natural foods, then I guess that's where you have to get your anti-inflammatories. But what do I know? I'm just a Mayo Clinic trained orthopedic surgeon, end quote. And what do you say to that? But don't you worry, I do have an obsession with natural products. I do think nature does a better job than man at a lot of things. Uh, and I'm gonna continue to educate you and let you know about this because unfortunately, that's the attitude a lot of Western medicine has and they're gonna keep all of this away from you because A, they don't know about it. And B, the whole system is geared to write for pharmaceuticals and to write for surgery. So look, I love surgery and I write for pharmaceuticals too, but I'm a huge believer that nature has it right we don't have it right. And in fact, I have a book that I wrote that you can get and give to your friends and family that kind of lays this all out, a very easy to read method so that you will have a weapon against this attitude. Because this, this is sad. But, I mean, really thinks that man is better than nature or God or whatever, uh, which I don't really agree with that. I don't think that we are that great. I'm not that arrogant. Um, as evidenced by the fact that our body of knowledge doubles almost every minute now, which means that we obviously didn't know a minute ago what we know now. We don't really know, you know, in the future, we're going to know more than we know now. So how do we think we're all knowing? So I try to promote natural methods of getting better. And the book Bone on Bone lets me do that for you because obviously the world can't come to my clinic. Sherry? Sherry said many of us had bad reactions to many pharmaceutical medications. Yes, um, the side effect profile, a lot of these synthetic drugs are terrible. And I don't know if you've noticed, you've probably got some elderly relatives who get a prescription, then they have a side effect, then they get a prescription for that side effect, then they get a prescription for that side effect. And then, oh, what do you know, this one's not working anymore, they switch that. And it's always it's just this cascade of drugs, most of them treating side effects of the other drugs. So I kinda don't think that's optimal, and I'm just giving you other things to think about other tools. All right, so what can you do? Again, remember I told you common sense trumps all. So sleep, better diet, minimize your mental stress, exercise, and generally just try to avoid badness. Um, so try to avoid thinking about things negatively. Try to avoid being adversarial. Try to be kind. Try to be thankful and have gratitude, have a good mindset, okay? That's gonna help minimize your mental stress. Sleep better, get a, get a solid schedule of going to bed early and waking up early. You'll eat less, you'll have a fasted state overnight that lets your body repair the meal and let those M2 macrophages do their job. A good diet's gonna give you all the tools that the, macro, the M2 macrophages and other resolving systems in your body need to get the job done. And then exercise. So. Muscle strength, bone strength, and then connective tissue tolerance, very important for long-term longevity, and also it turns out for brain health. So Bone on Bone talks about all of this, and it gives you a protocol um, and some steps you can take to incorporate this into your life. And it doesn't happen overnight. I started this journey for myself a few years ago, and I still don't have it perfect. Obviously, nobody's ever gonna have it perfect. But it is doable, even if you're working 80 hours a week or whatever. So this is possible. You're just gonna have to take the steps out of bone on bone that work for your life and then start to add the other ones as you feel better. They all are additive on each other. So if you sleep better, your diet's better. If you sleep better, you have less stress. If you sleep better, you're probably gonna have time and ability to exercise and you'll be avoiding bad things more often, right? And then likewise, if you have less stress, it's gonna be easier to eat your diet. It's gonna be easier to sleep. It's gonna be easier to exercise. If you exercise, you're going to have a better diet. You're going to sleep better. See what I mean? They all build on each other and work together to make you feel better. <clears throat> so sleep is usually important. We'll just go over this very briefly. You need high quality because you need deep sleep times with delta waves, and you need REM sleep. Low levels of REM, rapid eye movement sleep, is correlated with death, higher mortality rates. Humans need seven to nine hours of sleep. If anybody tells you otherwise, they're not right, generally speaking. There's like 
very small, less than one percent number of people left um, sleep. Two and seven and nine to do that whole maintenance process that happens overnight. So everything that was damaged during the day by diet toxins, micro tears, uh, whatever, any tissue that had a buildup of toxic sludge. The only time your body is able to switch it up and fix it and make you better is at night. The best thing is if you're fasted at the same time. If you're fasted and asleep, you are going to self-heal. And as this goes on night after night after night, you cannot help us with that in all aspects of your life. Less brain fog. Your heart works better. Your body feels better. Your skin feels better and looks better. You look better. Your hair does better. Everything does better. You start to get sleep. Like the other aspects of the protocol and the circadian rhythm is very, very important. We've talked about this in another talk. We evolved in a planet that circles the sun. So certain systems are turned on by UVB rays from the sunlight, certain systems are turned off, and vice versa. So if you don't follow the circadian rhythm, then the clock things that are embedded in your system and in almost every cell don't know when it's going on, they don't know when to turn on. So your cells don't know when they're supposed to be repairing or not repairing. And it just skews everything, especially the immune system. So having high quality sleep attached to a good circadian rhythm is a fundamental part of the bone on bone protocol. And then at night while you're asleep, the adenosine is cleared out of your brain, which builds up over the day and causes sleep pressure, right? Caffeine works, by the way, by blocking the adenosine receptors. So you get this false sense of low levels of adenosine, so low sleep pressure. Your brain is detoxified at night. Neural plasticity, this is when new neuron connections are made, when memories are cemented, and learning happens. The cells can maintain themselves systemically at night. The mitochondria is repaired and fixed at night. And then all of this is uh, dependent upon the cycle of light and dark, melatonin. Again, the reason why we But anyway, good sleep. Hugely important. One simple tool you can incorporate that actually works better than almost anything. Sleep and exercise are better than any known pharmaceutical. Okay, so here's some basic hints. I send people for sleep studies all the time. If you think you have sleep apnea, or if the person that is sleeping very thinks that you have sleep apnea, go get tested. It's highly associated with cognitive decline, stroke, other problems. There's no reason to not go get tested. There's new technology. There's new CPAPs that work better than the old ones. So sleep studies should be done. Your core body temperature has to drop for good sleep. So the optimal temperature of the room is 65 degrees, believe it or not. Try to avoid ice baths before bed because paradoxically, if you're surrounded by cold temperature, your core heats up and then that messes up. Routine, stay on schedule. Don't go to bed at one time during the week and then blow it out every weekend. Get what's called social jet lag that way. And then your circadian rhythm is just completely messed up. A dark room. Almost no light is better than anything. If you have to have light in your room, it should just be red light and it should be at floor level. You can avoid screens if at all possible, particularly small screens if you have a TV. At least turn that TV to warm settings so there's less blue light. You want to limit stimulants like caffeine and things like that after about 12 or 1 in the afternoon because the half light of caffeine is about 12 hours. And then you want to avoid alcohol within hours of sleep because it causes fragmented sleep. Um, it, that's just been shown in some studies. So there's some hints for better sleep. Again, all of this is in Bone on Bone, which you can get and just read over and over again to help feel better and fight back against the medical industry. Uh, the question is, do grounding blankets help with sleep? Honestly, I have not read any studies on that, uh, but I'm happy to do that and then maybe write a little ball about it. Uh, I don't have data to answer that question. But we'll take a note of that question. That's a good question. Next slide. Wait, whoa, was that the next slide? No? Okay, next slide. Okay, diet, I think after, well, I really don't know the best order of all of this. I think mindset probably, because you really need to believe in yourself. You have to be optimistic about your mindset. Sleep, hugely important. Diet, massively important. I like the Mediterranean diet more than any other dietary pattern out there because it's not only complete with micronutrients and fats, but the whole lifestyle encourages whole foods at home, uh, eating within certain time frames, eating with friends and family, and being social. Okay, and social connections are really the only thing that's ever been proven to prolong health span in life. 
anything else. So maintaining good, solid relationships with friends and family is going to help you more than any of the fancy, fancy things like hyperbaric oxygen baths, this and that, or all the stuff that you hear on the wellness channels. Just having really good friends and family cooking at home with healthy whole foods, the Mediterranean diet is your number one. Diet. It prevents, and this is proven in hundreds, if not thousands of studies, prevents non-communicable diseases like cancer, Alzheimer's, arthritis, diabetes. If you adhere to the Mediterranean diet, you in general have fewer of these lifestyle diseases than other people. And then if you have problems with chronic inflammation and oxidative stress and the diseases are, that are associated with that, if you incorporate this diet and stick with it, all of the symptoms get better. You may not necessarily cure the disease, but you will not have any relevant clinical symptoms if you get to this kind of a lifestyle. So what foods should you consume that are on the Mediterranean diet? So basically it's just an anti-inflammatory. So the number one thing to do is to avoid as many ultra processed foods as possible, particularly fast food. You could just do that, you're halfway there to the Mediterranean diet. Most ultra processed foods, if not filled with chemicals, are filled with advanced glycation end products, which then glom onto your connective tissues and make you feel like crap, um, and are highly anti-inflammatory and induce a leaky gut. So we want to avoid ultra processed foods. What does that mean? You got to go buy actual fruits, actual vegetables, actual beans, things like that, and make the food yourself. Most of these foods are very high in what we call phytochemicals, which is plant chemicals, and those are micronutrients. Okay, that's going to be your flavonoids, your phenols, your um, terpenes, things like that. All of the little chemicals that are found in the fruits, vegetables, leaves of the plant matter that we eat, vegetables. Each of those nutrients helps your cells function better, protect the cell membrane, reduce those transcription factors to turn on inflammation, and help the whole repair capacity. Dietary fiber is high in this diet. Dietary fiber feeds the good bacteria in the gut, prevents leaky gut, keeps things moving, keeps you healthier. Your gut is making the right proteins, not the wrong proteins, and everybody's happier. So fiber is massively important. And if you're eating eight to nine servings of fruits and vegetables a day, you're gonna get enough fiber. If you're not, you can always supplement with fiber, just add inulin or psyllium husk to whatever you're cooking. This diet is high in omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids. Now, the traditional Mediterranean diet is heavy in seafood. I personally kind of avoid seafood these days because of the commercial fishing industry and the pollution. Um, and a lot of the fish that you buy at the grocery store is injected with dye to make it look pretty. And is farm raised, which means they're feeding it omega-6 sources of food, not algae. So a lot of the farm raised fish does not even have omega-3. I supplement with omega-3. That's how I get my omega-3. But traditionally in the Mediterranean diet, it was heavy in seafood. And omega-3s are very anti-inflammatory, very pro-healing. They're not even really treated like fat in your body. They're not stored. They're used all the time because they're so integral to brain health, health of your neurons, health of the immune system, health of the cell membrane. So omega-3 is one of my go-to supplements that everybody should be on all the time because they're just too healthy. That's true for one. And then this diet is high in olive oil. Olive oil is a monounsaturated fat, okay? And it's... Um, Extra virgin olive oil is also replete or filled with phytochemicals, antioxidants. So if you get an extra virgin olive oil, and what I mean by really good is it's not counterfeit, it's been tested, um, and it hasn't been stored in the sunlight to make it become rancid. You get a really good extra virgin olive oil, you are by definition improving your fat profile, reducing your um, trans fat intake, and increasing your antioxidant. There's just a million things about the Mediterranean diet that I think is awesome. You could still eat red meat, you could still eat animal protein, you could still have a glass of wine every now and then. All of that is incorporated in this, so it's compatible with a normal social life too. Um, I'm just a big fan, and I will tell you that thousands of studies have shown massive health benefits to adherence to this diet. All right, I think we already talked about all that. Okay, just really quickly, the Osteoarthritis Initiative Study, which is a very large study that's been ongoing in the States for a while, they looked at 4,358 people that participated in the study. And they were specifically looking at the adherence to the Mediterranean diet type and the presence of arthritis. And they found the people with the highest adherence to the Mediterranean diet had almost 20% less knee arthritis, so one in five. So that's a massive reduction. No drug can do that for you, okay? They also had the side effect of having less death of all cause, lower BMI, meaning they were not as adaptive pose filled 
and less diabetes. And this was related, the authors felt, to the anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties found in this diet. So again, we're back to this diet works for your musculoskeletal problems because it's anti-inflammatory naturally and it's antioxidant naturally. Number one rule, avoid ultra-processed foods. Almost impossible to do in this country. I still cannot avoid all ultra-processed foods. It is 80% of what the food industry gives us. On top of that, this is what they're feeding the animals that then becomes the meat that you eat that you think is whole food, but it's really ultra-processed. So when I eat meat, I try to look for cage-free, organic, grass-finished. Grass-fed is, is kind of a marketing thing. Everything's grass-fed and it's not. So you want grass-finished. You want to avoid any excess sugar in that aisle in the grocery, and really most of the grocery, even potato chips have added sugar so that you can trick your body into wanting more potato chips. Because I don't know if you know, but if you just sat and ate salt, at a certain point, you're going to stop eating the salt because your system's going to say you don't want any more salt. But if the salt is mixed with sugar, that signal never happens and you just keep eating. So you want to avoid added sugar. You definitely always want to avoid fructose. I have a lot of patients that tell me, oh, I drink tart cherry juice. I'm fine. That is not true. Tart cherry juice has just, it's essentially just fructose because you've taken all the fiber of the cherry out. And sure, there might be some phytochemicals in the tart cherry juice, but it's surrounded by massive amounts of fructose. So you're defeating the purpose. So you're basically giving yourself insulin resistance and advanced medication end products and inflammation just to get a few molecules of the antioxidant effects of the tart cherry. So I take tart cherry extract because I don't want that fructose that's found in the juice. And then of course, you wanna avoid pesticides and chemicals if at all possible. But as I say, any vegetable is better than no vegetable. So if all you can get is non-organic, still eat it, it's still better than no vegetable. And then basically you really should avoid 80% of what's sold at the grocery store. That's not possible. So just buy as many real, normal, whole foods that you could probably find somewhere in nature and cook it yourself. The government is starting to realize this. They're even thinking about changing the dietary guidelines and maybe taking some sugar out of school lunches. This study was 20 adult inpatients, so they forced people to stay in a hospital for two weeks. One group was fed all processed foods only. One group was fed unprocessed or minimally processed foods only. They were matched for macronutrients, so the same number of carbs, same number of fats, same number of protein. And then it was ad libitum, meaning you could eat whatever you want, but you can only eat this kind of food, you can only eat this kind of food. Essentially, I guess the buffets they presented were matched. At the end of the two weeks, they found that the people in the ultra processed food generally ate 500 calories more each day. So the school of thought, old school, was 3,500 calories is a pound. So that means if you're on an ultra processed diet, you're automatically going to get a pound a week just because of the diet. And you're eating the same number of calories as the other group but the other groups, I'm sorry, the same amount of food, but the other group is just naturally stopping themselves from wanting more because they're eating food that doesn't have sugar mixed with salt, mixed with fat, and becomes highly addictive. The body weight changes were highly correlated with the diet differences. So obviously the ultra processed group lost muscle, got fatter, et cetera. And then the non-ultra processed group felt better, didn't weigh as much, um, and ate less. So this is just in two weeks, and there were these massive differences and changes of weight um, just with the type of food people were allowed to eat. Next slide. Okay, so my answer to that doctor's comment before is that yes, nature does make things better than man. So he must think that potato chips are better than potatoes, that hamburgers are better than a grass-fed steak you cook yourself at home that a milkshake is better than milk, I can go on and on. Cheetos are better than cheese, et cetera, et cetera. I don't agree with that. I think our synthetic things are not as good as our natural things. So I would rather that you take ginger, turmeric, tartary extract, omega-3, then take a bunch of Snilovirx or take a bunch of ibuprofen. Now, I still prescribe these things, and my patients still need it, but they need it less often, and they have fewer side effects, and they just feel better. So I think you should go for natural things as a part of your lifestyle change. For that. Just so you know, with ultra processed foods as well, um, these the, the lists on the left are ingredients that the FDA has said are fine and safe and not damaging. Partially hydrogenated oils, which essentially become trans fats. Foods with flame retardants are okay. Brominated vegetable oil, by the way, is one of these. Choline or olestra, which caused anal leakage in some people. 
caramel and other co colorings are okay, but they've been linked with cancer risk. Uh, genetically modified um, growth hormone in the dairy industry has been determined to be okay. High fructose corn syrup was determined to be okay. MSG, the pink slime that is put in meat sludge when they're making highly processed meats, like slices of ham you get at the deli and stuff like that, that's been deemed okay. So all of that is man's attempt at improving nature, and I'm just not sure that that's better. I don't think it is. I try to buy as natural of a food as I can, and we cook it ourselves. And also, to somebody's point earlier, that's a great, great question. A third of the FDA-approved pharmaceuticals have problems with side effects and issues like that, and that was a journal of the American Medical Association. 5% of approved drugs are pulled off the market each year for 100% side effects. Okay, and then back to the food, which is also under the purview of the FDA or the USDA sometimes. The food additives are really there to help the processors to increase the shelf life, the palatability, the addictive nature of the food, and it's effective pleasing to the human brain. But they've only ever been studied for their effects on the liver and kidney. Nothing's been studied for its effect on inflammation, oxidative stress, mitochondrial health, and immune system. So just know that you evolved on a natural planet with the sun in the dark, and you should probably eat natural foods. And man has been doing this to us for what, since the 60s? Maybe we don't know what we're doing. Maybe we've gotten it wrong. So in summary, if you want to self-manage and fight back against chronic inflammation, oxidative stress, mitochondrial failure, if you want to feel better and have less symptoms from arthritis and connective tissue disorders, get good sleep, avoid stress, try to incorporate the Mediterranean diet into your life, which will help with weight loss and avoiding insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome. Exercise, which we didn't really get into too much in this talk. And personally, I think you should still take antioxidants and natural antioxidants. All of this is going to be discussed in Vocal Bone, which um, is available this month. It's getting published this month. It's available for pre order now on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, actually. So, antioxidant therapy, I take antioxidants every day because I know. Being surrounded by pollution, having people stress, my job stressful, and not having a perfect diet, um, I'm producing too many reactive oxygen species for my system to handle. So I take antioxidants to help that. And this is due to excess nutrient processing and often just due to lack of cofactors. For instance, 60% of Americans are magnesium deficient. Magnesium is a cofactor for hundreds of enzymatic reactors in the body. A lot of us are zinc deficient. Zinc is a cofactor for hundreds of processes, so on and so forth. So I try to give my body every single micronutrient possible so that it functions at an optimal level, and hopefully I'll have a great health plan. I don't want to accumulate reactive oxygen species because it, they cause lipid peroxidation, which is uh, when you damage the fatty cell membrane. It disrupts the cell membrane, which means none of the channels and receptors will work right. It causes proteins to misfold or unfold, um, and that's not good. And then it damages DNA. So I want to collect all these extra reactive oxygen species that are excessive, and some are normal, and some are Do nothing excessive. And then I want them to be neutralized by antioxidants. So I try to eat as many fruits and vegetables a day, but obviously not is a lot when you're super busy. Um, so I take supplements, yes. Antioxidants. And then dietary polyphenols and HA have been shown to be useful in many studies. And we're starting to learn more and more. Completely. And if you look at the molecule studies for like looking at vitamin E, or looking at vitamin C, they're very short term studies and they don't talk about any other aspect of person's life. So I'm just going with common sense that if you are healthy and you eat right and you sleep well and you take health and supplements, you're probably better off than not. But are there great randomized, super controlled, double blind studies? To no. But are there tons of studies looking at the Mediterranean diet that show overall much? Health and happiness? Yes. Okay, we have some questions. Okay. So somebody in Chicago and somebody in Georgia want to know if I do consults by Zoom. This is an issue that I have a license, a medical license. You have a medical license. 
if I give advice to somebody that lives in Chicago, then that statement assumes that I practice medicine in the state of Illinois without a license from the state of Illinois. So when you are a licensed physician, you can get in a lot of trouble doing these things. We're trying to work out how to be able to offer consulting recommendations without acting like a physician in that state. Now, if I were just a personal trainer, left or right, taking health advice, I could do all of whatever I want, right? But because I have a medical degree, I'm a little bit limited. Now, I have a license in Texas, Louisiana, so in those states, yes. But working on a way to offer health services to those of you that are out of state or where I'm not licensed. Um, but just know that having a degree sort of makes it harder to do. And, and honestly, our medical board doesn't know, our practice in don't know, the attorneys don't know. We're trying to figure all this out. Uh, one lady wants to know what I work through her primary care doctor. Well, if the primary care doctor wants that, potentially yes. Yeah. But um, okay. So this is somebody with osteoporosis who's tried natural remedies to prevent it. Um, yeah, sometimes if your osteoporosis is bad enough, you do need to go on some of the drugs. Now, I granted they're not great drugs. There are some newer ones that are working a little bit better, like selective estrogen, some of the biologics. That they care about. Um, but once you get up to osteopenia or better, some people can get off of those medicines. In fact, taking holiday recommended, and then you can just maintain with calcium D3, K2, and resistance exercise. That's probably the most important. But yeah, I mean, I'm happy to work with whomever if it's possible. So my recommendations for some active supplements to make your arthritic or musculoskeletal connected to you better. Okay. Somebody just asked which supplements can help as we change our lifestyle, diet, and sleep. Well, this is a short list to start with. Okay. The joint health multi, I tell people to take in the morning, tart cherry extract at night. The omega-3, I'm agnostic at the time of day, same with the arthritis gummy. Okay. Tart cherry extract, naturally, all pigmented fruits naturally have a little bit of melatonin in them. So you want to take the night. The tart cherry extract in this is 1500 milligrams of the flavonoid found in the tart cherry that is actually anti-inflammatory, down-regulates NFTB, like we talked about, promotes healing and wellness, has no GI side effects, it has no cardiac side effects, and to my knowledge, no adverse events have been noticed, and a lot of people have great pain relief, and on top of all of that, it reduces levels of uric acid. So tart cherry extract at night. The Joint Health Multi combines turmeric with ginger root and piperine and PEA. What's PEA? PEA is pentoid ethylamide. This is actually found in your body. It's ubiquitous. It's found throughout your body. It's produced all the time in the face of damage, inflammation, and nerve. So if you're low in the PEA system, which is part of your endocannabinoid system, so this is why people take C and THC and things like that, the endocannabinoid system tries to keep things in balance. PEA is part of that. PEA reduces the degranulation of the mast cells at peripheral nerve endings, so it reduces nerve pain, and helps nerve health. So I put PEA with the turmeric and the ginger root because it helps reduce the peripheral nerve ending sensitivity at the level of the joint. Meanwhile, turmeric's down-regulating the transcription factors that cause inflammation, helping to alter the M1-M2 macrophage balance, anti-inflammatory, antioxidant. Same with the ginger root. Ginger and study head-to-head -head against enzymes they have a great track record. They work as well, if not better, and no side effects. So joint help multi in the morning, tart cherry at night. The arthritis can be taken throughout the day. It's basically just a little bit more PEA, some bromelade, which is down from pineapple, and known to be highly inflammatory. And then boswellia, which is frank, also known to be highly inflammatory and antioxidant. Then omega 3, I'm a huge proponent, can't say enough about it. All of us should be on omega 3. It's definitely not good for diet, you're not getting enough of it, um, unless you're very, very lucky. I personally try to take two grams a day. You can take anywhere from two to four grams a day. There's a lot of studies that show no adverse bleeding events, even up to four grams a day. Obviously, you want to check your temperature, particularly if you're on the blood thinner. But omega-3 will embed itself in your brain in the neurons. It'll make your brain less inflamed. You'll have a better mindset, you'll sleep better, you'll be able to manage stress and life better. 
on top of that, it is naturally anti-inflammatory. It puts you down an anti-inflammatory cascade of good cytokine signaling rather than a pro-inflammatory cascade. So omega-3s are just really important. And I take that, I take them in the morning. Some people take them in the morning, it matters. But tart cherries should be taken at night. So that's my book, Bone on Bone. I've spent a lot of time on this on weekends for the past couple of years. Um, thanks to Ben Bella Books, who are my publisher and their editor, we were able to make it into a better framework and a little bit more concise language. And it's really meant to be kind of, I think of it as a common sense guidebook that tells you the science behind why all of this works and how to incorporate the protocol into your lifestyle. And I don't want you to beat yourself up. I think you have to make massive changes overnight or nothing's going to work. Because that just induces mental stress. Which is bad. Just pick an area of your life that you know you can improve a little bit and start there. Because what inevitably happens is as you feel just, for, let's say, 2% better for one move you make, let's say you stop drinking uh, red coat. Let's say you stop drinking for a month any beverage that has high fructose corn syrup in it or, or has levels of fructose like you after that month, you're going to feel so much better that you're going to want to make a second move. And you're just going to be accretive. You're just going to add steps. So this is going to build on itself naturally. So you don't need to make some elaborate calendar. If I don't do this, you know, I'm going to get my cup. Nope, because you're going to have a positive mindset about this. And you're just going to do the steps you can do. Some people are shift workers. So this thing's going to be tough for them. I get it. But you incorporate the rest of the protocol until you can't get a good sleep. So hopefully this helps you out. I did it because I wanted to have a bigger impact and get all of this knowledge out to people who I can't talk to the clinic about it. And that's why I wrote the book. So bone on bone kind of goes over inflammation, how it affects your joints, your musculoskeletal system, and how to combat all of it. You want to do that question? No, that's not you. Oh yeah, that's not me. I use AI to make that picture, um, which is kind of scary. It actually went to the website I worked with the website, described me in words, and then started making pictures. I had to, I had to change it because it started with brown eyes and glasses. So I took the prompt, but I wanted to play with it, and that's what we ended up with. Um, and then that is the cover of my book. Oh yes, it just came out in Audible as well. If you if you commute a lot or you prefer to listen to books that way. Any further questions? Okay, we got questions. We have impatient kids. Angela, thank you. I'm literally crying right now. I'm been adorable, but now I have. Angela is recovering from a fusion. I assume a lumbar fusion or cervical, and says she's maybe not doing so well, but she feels good about it. That she has hope now. Good, Angela, because one of the messages I impart in Bone on Bone is. I want you to avoid surgery and avoid drugs, but if you have to take drugs or you have to have surgery, the outcome should be better. So hopefully, you've already had the fusion, what's done is done, the past is a past. Going forward in the future, I think you can have a better outcome if you start to incorporate the steps of this protocol. Hypothorism, Hashimoto's, osteoporosis, high cholesterol. What would you recommend for me? I have my Syracuse 13 and 5. I have lots of This is really all the talk. Okay, wow. That's a lot. So somebody has, <clears throat> okay, there's a patient out, or not a patient, there's a person out there. Of course, I'm not an the treating physician. This is for educational entertainment purposes only. Um, somebody out there has multiple medical problems and wants to know what can they take with a high CRP. So let's assume you start eating right and you're sleeping a little bit better and you work on all that and you work on maybe some meditation, maybe some deep breathing, you try to control the mental stress, get your cortisol under control. Um, I would say you probably have low D, most people do. I would start with D3, um, probably add K2 and omega-3 because those are your baseline anti-inflammatory. There are vitamin D receptors on every immune cell and omega-3 gets embedded in every cell on the body. Well, that's going to be the widest systemic effects. Um, 
probably the joint health multi is very reliable go-to to sort of give you baseline inflammatory control. Remember, if you already have joint pain, then you're starting a little bit behind the eight ball, right? So just be patient. Most natural things take 60 to 90 days to sort of embed in the system because remember, the natural medicines are trying to change the levels of the transcription factors that are turning on the pro-inflammatory cytokines. They're not just turning off one enzyme out in the periphery that affects symptoms. So it takes longer. So you're trying to make systemic changes. So two to three months, I would give each supplement that you try. Um, but what I would say is if you can exercise, just gaining a little bit of muscle strength really helps pain a lot. And then the sleep schedule is hugely important. I would start with that. But what can you take for those various issues? I would do D3. I would do the tumor or the joint health multi. I would definitely do omega-3. Um, probably just the arthritis because you have it around. I think ALA is a good one because that helps the nervous system health and brain health and will help reduce pain in general, particularly any sort of neuropathic pain. Thyroid's tricky Hashimoto's is very common and rampant, and I know you just sort of have to let it burn itself out. So the thyroid blows up, and then you go on the thyroid. We don't really have a great handle on that in medicine at this point. Um, but I think as long as you can get more M2 to M1, maybe your thyroid can start to heal itself a little bit. Glycine, which is part of our mindset series, is a fundamental part of the connective tissue molecules, so like the collagen bundles. And it's also calming to the brain, right? It turns them into glutamate. So glycine is an amino acid that could potentially help as well. And then things like 5-HTP, which upregulates serotonin, which also helps your mood and reduces pain. Because the brain controls a lot of pain. We have these things called descending inhibitory pathways, and you can actually turn down or turn up any given pain signal. Well, if you have the right components in your brain, you can always turn down pain signals. That means your brain cannot be inflamed. And you have the right levels of serotonin. So 5-HTP, omega-3, glycine, that helps with that. I don't, what? She wants to know about stacking? Okay. I Stacking of uh, supplements. So if you have one condition, you can take supplements for that condition, but then if you need to add another one, you can take supplements for that condition so you can stack. And some conditions respond to multiple supplements. So like omega-3 is going to help you with autoimmune uh, as well as with prothrombotic states as well as with high, highly inflammatory conditions. D3 is going to help almost all conditions. Most people are magnesium deficient. Most people are zinc deficient. So there's some fundamental supplements that help all problems. And then you can get a little bit more specific after that. Um, cholesterol, high levels of cholesterol in your serum is usually related to insulin resistance. So berberine helps with that. Most fat in your, in your bloodstream is not from dietary fat, not what you eat. It's actually sugar or fructose that has been processed in fat. That's the kind of dirty truth of it all that has probably been hidden from you. You really have to manage the glucose, which means berberine, and obviously changing your diet. Very high CRP and inflammation numbers. Yeah, so her husband has PMR, or polymyalgia rheumatica, which is a very common condition in people in their 50s and 60s. This is when you get achy, proximal, like hip and shoulder pain when you wake up, and it takes an hour or so to work it out and feel better, and you just kind of have general aches and pains throughout the day. The number one go-to way to treat this in the medical community is with high doses of prednisone, which is a steroid, which is, of course, terrible. That's all we have for PMR. So I don't know if your husband's on prednisone or not. Um, Probably that means he's going to have to really work on the sleep at night um, because the prednisone is going to operate cortisol levels, which of course regulates inflammation, ironically, because you're trying to decrease inflammation with a steroid. Um, but what I would say for PMR is you just got to get your ligaments and tissues looser, more flexible. So you got to have better cross links. So vitamin C, glycine, like we talked about, omega-3 makes people looser in general because you put omega-3 in the cell membranes instead of omega-6, the cell membrane is more flexible. And if you add billions of flexible cell membranes together, then you get flexible tissue. So over about two or three months, if you take enough omega-3, you'll start to just feel looser. So that, that stiffness that's associated with PMR gets a little bit better. 
that anything to reduce inflammation will be helpful. Turmeric, ginger, PEA, ALA, berberine to reduce the insulin load. Now, all of this you're going to have to run by your doctor too, because I don't know if you're prone to hypoglycemia or whatever. But, uh, and also you don't want to just stop part of the zone cold turkey, obviously. Um, but you can maybe start to add some natural things in addition to stretching and building muscle strength, and then hopefully maybe be able to reduce the prednisone. Are you aware of any compounded estrogen blocker meds? Am I aware of any compounded estrogen blocking meds? So this, I would assume to be receptor blockers or selective estrogen receptor blockers. Uh, is one that's used for osteoporosis. Compounded, I assume you must be talking about aromatase inhibitors. Oh, this is, somebody's asking a question about estrogen blocker drugs that are doing with them that they're taking after cancer. This is the whole thing, a rough case of like Clomacin, Oridex, et cetera. I assume that's what you're talking about. Um, and I think the recommended time frame to be on those drugs just went up to 10 years to prevent recurrence of cancer. Uh, but they do have a lot of musculoskeletal side effects. There's no great answer to this problem because if you've had cancer, you actually don't want the cancer to come back. And that's what these drugs are. Uh, some of the cancer doctors will change the drug, change the dose. They'll work with you if you're having a lot of musculoskeletal side effects. But I would not recommend getting off of those drugs because they do prevent the cancer from recurring. You're just going to have to treat the aching pain and the inflammation around it with all of the supplements I already talked about. And then having a solid sleep schedule is going to really help. Um, being exposed to sunlight in the morning, dimming down the lights at night, helps with sleep schedule. And then working on muscle strength really helps joint pain as well. You're going to have to do all the other tools because I don't think that you want to have a cancer recurrence just to get off those meds. And I don't think this is a great compounded alternative to the ones that have been studied in terms of cancer recurrence. CRP is C-reactive protein. That is a protein produced by the liver when you are in a pro state. So it goes up when you have an infection goes up with the kind of injury. So that's just one of our very, very basic screening biomarkers that we have to look for information. Yes, Okay. Yeah, so the gentleman with PMR, uh, his physician told him that the diet doesn't matter, but sugar has to be I don't agree that diet doesn't matter, but I totally agree that sugar has to go. That is part of the diet. Too much sugar builds up the gas glycation end products in your body, which are all connected to tissue stiffer. So it's just going to make you feel bad even if you didn't have PMR. And it causes insulin resistance, which means your muscle can't respond to load properly, your bone can't respond to load properly, and all of your chronic pain. Um, modifiers in the brain and the nervous system are regulated, you have more pain. So yeah, getting sugar under control is really, really important. We help people with that all the time. I've even used now Trexin to reduce sugar addiction. Sugar is highly addictive and good for you if you've been able to cut down the sugar. It takes a long time to do it. It probably takes five to six weeks, just like any addiction. Last one. Last question. Fabulous. Thank you for all you do. It wasn't really a question. Somebody said, bone on bone is fabulous. Thank you for my supplements and all. You're welcome. I love doing this. And hopefully, what? Yeah, I'm going to say that. Oh, and happy Memorial Day. And remember, Memorial Day, I'm military. I'm a member. Memorial Day is in honor of all the soldiers who died. Just kind of keep that in mind on Monday. It's not just on the party rah rah, maybe just. Take a moment, like 30 seconds, to just think about all of the soldiers all along the way since America's been around who have died to let us be the freest nation on earth. All right. Have a great day.